The presenting sponsor for On Education is Schoology. Schoology is not only the best learning management system, it's also a community of lifelong learners. Join On Education at the Schoology Next Conference July 16th through 18th in San Diego, California. This is a chance to immerse yourself in hands-on workshops, advanced product training sessions, and best practice presentations. If you want to learn more about Schoology and how they can help you advance what's possible, visit Schoology.com. I use the term, they've jumped the shark. So you don't even know yes. what this term means, though. I've never even heard that before. So I've I saw never it, heard I, the term I, I saw it on shark. the paper, uh, you know, this past week when you typed that in there. And I was like, well, maybe that's a Canadian thing. <laughs> Welcome to On Education. I'm Mike Washburn. And I'm Glenn Urban. Friends, we have an awesome pod for you today. We'll tell you how the NHL has officially jumped the shark. We'll share the latest news on us and more ISTE plans. And as always, we will tackle the latest in the world of education, politics, and policy. And we're really excited to speak with the rabbi Michael Cohen this week as he previews his keynote for ISTE. I'm really tired. Are you? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> I hate sleeping in tents. Uh, I do too, actually. <laughs> we're gonna Which, try to buy a, We're gonna try to buy a trailer next year because I can't do it anymore. So I'm a scout leader, like a camper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm a I'm a scout leader. Added to the list of the things I don't have time to do, but you know, since I'm spending at least 25 hours a week working on this, um, I'm not spending as much time with my families as I should. So, um, <laughs> scouting is something that definitely cannot be cut. My no. wife would never allow it. That's important. So, so that means I go to um, four scout camps a year, and um, they're exhausting. So, they're exhausting. what do you guys do? Like besides camp and we, tents, it's a yeah. bunch of activities, right? Yeah, I mean, I do the cooking. So, uh, we have people that are really good at like leading games and events and stuff like that. I, I cook. I'm, I'm pretty good at that, for for like you know, fifteen, twenty, twenty people. Yeah. So. Um, you know, we do pretty basic stuff. We, we like to mix it up. So this, this time we had a barbecue. So one of the leaders had like a portable barbecue. So he brought, uh, he brought that. And so we had hamburgers and hot dogs and, uh, salads and fruit. And it's, it's, it's very glamping, but not like glamping, like, like rich people, but it's glamping for kids. That's for sure. They don't have to do anything. And, you know, they get fit pretty well. We've had tacos at camp before. Mm, that um, sounds good. We've, we've definitely had, we've done spaghetti and garlic bread before. That doesn't sound um, like camping food. No, no, it's <laughs> not. But it's fun. It's fun to make and the kids love it. Um, when we always do like the recap of the year, which we just did last week at our scout meeting on Monday, um, I always get at least one or two shout outs that the, the food was the best part of the whole year. Yeah. So, you know, I feel pretty good about that. Yeah. And it's great time, obviously, with your kids connect acting and and uh, doing that whole thing so that's important yeah i mean isaac isaac loves it so i i mean i do it for him and um it's it's really like a large amount of time that we can we can spend together um and he's he's like me very much in so many ways so he's definitely not an outdoorsy type person okay so this you know this gets his <laughs> this gets his butt outside a little bit and <laughs> gets you both outside it gets well like i said i end up staying inside the whole time because i'm camping oh, or i'm uh yeah, I'm you're cooking. cooking yeah yeah but I uh no i get some outside and building fires and tying knots and hey that's you know, awesome stuff scooping scooping fish out of ponds and all the other nonsense that we do in scouts i guess <laughs> I'm not into any of it, but I mean, I appreciate it. It's awesome. Yes. I appreciate the values of scouting. I really do. And that's why I'm, I'm there. Right. I I mean, I, I do think that there's some value. There's a lot of value there and, um, it definitely teaches kids some interesting skills. I was, yeah. I always tell people, Mike, that if there was a zombie apocalypse, you know, and, uh, you know, the grid went out and computers were useless and there was no more electricity that I would be the most worthless person to be around. (laughs) I'd be that one guy that has no skills. Can you do this? Nope, I have no idea how to do it. Uh, so probably I couldn't tell the... you not to save my life. No, so I'm, I'm hoping my son also learns those skills. <laughs> I, I I have to bring this up, and okay, because we talked about it in the intro. The the as a, as a Canadian, okay. I am uh, socially obligated to watch at least a little bit of the Stanley Cup Finals. Um, <laughs> I imagine. I, I've definitely my interest in hockey has waned. Um, over the last probably five years or so, okay. uh, I'm definitely more into baseball now than hockey. That well, being said, I'm not watching. I'm not watching anything right now. Sure, you're um, super busy. But 
so I turn on the Stanley Cup Finals, Game One. It's uh, <laughs> Vegas against um, Vegas against Washington, yes. and uh, and they're in Vegas. Of course, they're in Vegas. First off, it's unbelievable that Vegas even made the playoffs. The, they they're predicted them to, team, right? to be like they're an expansion team. They were predicted to be in like last place. Of course, um, but you know, Mark Andre <laughs> Fleury, and you know, things happen. Um, but in 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 such amazing Vegas fashion. They did the most ridiculous intro that I've ever seen. For, I've never seen anything like this. And and I, yeah, we were talking off air about the. I use the term they've jumped the shark. So you don't even know yes. what this term means, though. I've never even heard that before. So I've I saw never it, heard I, the term. I saw it on the, the paper, uh, you know, this past week when you typed that in there, and I was like, well, maybe that's a Canadian thing. I don't know. It's an idiom of some sort. I imagine that it means that they've gone off the ledge or something like that. That kind of thing. It just means that there it's it's gotten it's gotten ridiculous. Gotten now. ridiculous. So okay. so it, it comes from the show Happy Days. Do you remember the show oh, yeah. Happy Days? Yeah, with the Fonz and yeah. whatever. Love that. So show. so in the waning season, waning episodes of Happy Days, um, the Fonz yeah goes um, water skiing. Okay. <laughs> I guess I never saw this episode. And he's wearing right. Well, no one did. <laughs> is kind of the point okay and he's wearing his as far as i can if i can remember correctly i should have looked at the video just before this but if i remember he was wearing his leather jacket of course he and, was and he and he jumps off of like a ramp into over and over like a, a shark okay and he literally jumped a shark I get and it you. was like it was like a stunt it was, so right? it was to try yeah. to get it was stupid and they were trying to get people to watch the stupid show again and it had gotten dumb and um, so, so it was, that's, that's where the term jumping the shark comes from. Awesome. Anyways, this, this is dumb. It was so <laughs> dumb. I and actually I was, like it. looking at it just going, <laughs> what is this nonsense? I bet you the people in Montreal, if we have any Montreal listeners, I'd love to hear from you because <laughs> Montreal Canadians fans are angry, um, <laughs> and, and passionate and they're, they do a lot of like presentations and like on ice stuff mainly because they have a history of you know generally being awesome okay um and and having a lot of awesome players that they should be celebrating um but you know so it was too gaudy but it it was was just but it's totally vague they had like roman people like soldiers and arrows and it was like game of thrones meets hockey it was very game of thrones (laughs) meets hockey in Except like, really cheesy. <laughs> but in Vegas. Game of Thrones exactly. meets hockey in Vegas. It's exactly yeah. if that's if that's what you're thinking, that's exactly what it like that's exactly what it was. It was You know what it reminded me of is oh. I've been to this place a, a, a few different times and I'm definitely gonna take my sons uh, when they get older. It's a place called Medieval Times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have one in it, Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah. that's what it kind of reminds me of because it's really cheesy. But yes. it's like, you're, but, but, but you guys, uh, when you're at those events, you play into the cheesiness, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then you, you just kind of participate. Yeah. You play along and participate. That's actually all of Vegas. Everything is so fake and gaudy, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, over the top. But it's part of the experience. So then this is the perfect match to Ugh. it. So I thought that was, it was hilarious. It was a five minute Game of Thrones Spectacle. meets hockey. Yeah, it's exactly. So it was, it was awesome. really cool. awful. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but you... You know, when you're there, it's fine. I, it's fun, I'm sure. But when you're watching TV, you're just thinking, listen, man, that was five minutes of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> it was awesome. something, man. So anyways, uh, we're going to put the YouTube video for this this ridiculous intro in the show notes. You should watch it. It'll, it'll sure. make you laugh. Um, and, and, and maybe you can tell us if I'm right or wrong on this. Maybe, maybe I'm just being too serious about it, but it was just too much. I'm like going, uh, what? Oh, and now there's a fire breathing dragon. No, Anyways, I don't think there was a fire breathing dragon. Maybe there was, I can't remember. Um, what a mess. Um, we're going to be at IST. I think we've yes. talked about that a little bit. Yes, we have. Just, we're excited. Just a little. Yes. Yeah, we're excited. Um, we are thinking about having... It's come up on Twitter about having a meetup, getting yeah. together. We need out. to have a meetup. So I think we should do that. I think we should try to do that. Okay. So I think what we should do is um, put it out there again to see if people want to hang out at Batterbrow. 
Okay. Uh, it's literally right around the corner from the hotels. Like if you're staying at the Marriott or the or the Hyatt, um, it's just on the other side, uh, down the road a bit. Okay. I walked there when we were at School G Next last year. We walked from Batterbrow back to the hotel. It's like a 15 minute walk. Okay. You don't even have to take an Uber. It was great. It's a great place. Awesome beer. Um, we should totally go there. So, and they have food. They have food and stuff. And they, it's a big space. So, so we can, you know, if we wanted to do it, and um, I think there's been some talk of doing some board games, a little, a little Catan. That would be awesome. Yeah. Maybe we'll do that. I, I think, I, yeah, I think so. So we'll put it out, and we are inviting. Of course, we're talking about our Games for Ed community, our Minecraft Edu. The Explore Like a Pirate community, or our Schoology friends, just anybody. Let's just meet up and uh, have a night of fun. The esports edu folks, if anyone oh, of you guys yes. is coming, yeah, for sure. Let's just come over. We're just going to bring have our fun. laptops. Oh, you bring your laptops. Set up a network. Play some <laughs> league. Oh, now you're talking nerd talk. Play though. some Heroes of the Storm. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> Oh, that's Who's awesome. Who's with me? Oh, God. I don't know. That sounds like fun. <laughs> that's awesome. So we'll set something up, right? We're going to go ahead and start posting some, yeah. some things on Twitter, and then we'll see what what night and time works well for people. Yeah. We'll, we'll put it out there. We'll put it out into the universe, as my friend Nicole would say. Perfect. And see what, uh, see what, see the, what universe, happens. See what the universe says. <laughs> see how it responds. Uh, speaking of video games. Okay. Let's talk about City Skylines EDU by Teacher Gaming. Um, so... <laughs> It, it is ridiculously amazing. First of all, I've played City Skylines uh, starting probably was three or four years ago. I think was when it yes. came when it came out, you know? Yes. Uh, and so I love the game anyway. And now to have this EDU version by Teacher Gaming, I tried it out already and I'm, I'm developing a review. And I actually have my uh, 10-year-old son who's going to be 11 this summer. And I have recruited him to be my uh, student tester. And we're going to try several of the different educational scenarios, all kinds of super cool stuff. Uh, and then great reflections and lessons that come along with with the game itself. So you get to play the game and then at the end you get to talk about why things worked out a certain way or why they didn't and why we shouldn't do things that we normally do You know, when we're constructing cities. Um, and it is just an awesome game and it plays really, really well. So I played it on on the uh, MacBook, that's those MacBooks that we just got, um, and it's it's uh, definitely uh, streaming or playing really easily, no glitches. Um, so uh, I can't wait to put the review together and then post it on our blog post. So we're gonna do that. We're gonna put it on the blog. Yeah. Uh, Glenn's gonna have screenshots and maybe even a video embedded in I the blog. I think I'll do a like, video too. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then um, we're also going to um, really take a deep dive into it in uh in a segment on the pod um coinciding when when the review comes out so stay tuned for that we're gonna get that done before isti because isti's gonna be bonkers uh so hopefully no pressure glenn gets it done in the next uh week or two and then Easy. we will be uh <laughs> we will be good to go it's gonna be gonna be pretty awesome um so you came across this thing on twitter um yes. from alice Yes, Alice Keeler has a blog post article, and we're going to go ahead and link uh, to her posts because we want to make sure we give her credit. Um, but basically, she just uh, talks about how much money we actually are spending each year on just apps, you know. And really, these apps are the things that we we've, we've had this discussion with uh, teachers pay teachers and just teachers reaching into their own pockets and spending that money. You know, we were talking about, uh, yeah. what was that one, Padlet earlier this year? Yeah. Uh, whether or not it's worth paying that, whatever the cost is per month and, and you know, and justifying those things. And she uh, has a great article about it. And then the coolest part is basically they're developing a way to be able to coordinate with the uh, the fundraising site called Pledge Sense and, um, and being able to find a way basically to fund people's desires and wants to go ahead and do great things in their classrooms. We're talking about things like Flipgrid and uh, Nearpod. 
and all of the in Minecraft, you know, uh, Minecraft EDU costs five dollars per student per year. So, mm-hmm. and, and people are reaching into their own pocket and just paying for these things, you know, because you're, the school districts are strapped and they're like, well, we can't afford to buy those uh, things, and so. Uh, you know, it's not going to be on you if you want them. You're going to have to spend, and people are spending, you know, out of their own pockets. So it's a great movement. We'll go ahead and link uh, to Alice Keeler's blog post article about it. And then I highly encourage you. She has a Google form to sign up on at the bottom, which is the hashtag Teachers Are Professionals. And why don't you go ahead and get in there and and fill out uh, that Google form? I think that's what they're trying to do: is gather uh, as many people as possible to support this cause. And then uh, they're going to take some next steps. So we're excited to to see what where are the next steps and where do they lead and how that association with the Pledge Sense uh, fundraising sites how it how it all works together. I've been thinking about this a little bit since it, it got it got on the outline, and um, I have two thoughts related to it. Um, the first one being that equity is something that everyone is dealing with. It, it, it's actually not a, a problem just in the in the U.S. We have equity issues, um, you know, disparities of availability of devices and money at schools in Canada, uh, in Ontario as well. And so, you know, if you have, like, I I feel pretty lucky in some cases. I I have a school that pays for almost everything that I need. Um, when it's been approved, like if, if we decide to use it, like, so if I say, I want to, I want a life, I want a year subscription to Padlet, they'll say, okay. And yeah. they pay for it. On I the... mean, that's very unique though. Yeah. That's yeah. No, that's life. my point is that I'm, I'm the outlier in this case. And, and I get, I get that. And, but there are a lot of teachers out there that definitely have the passion, the skills, the innovation, you know, the ability to do awesome things. They just don't have the tools to do it. And yes. it would be nice to be able to help those people. So if you're one of the people that has, you know, maybe a little more than you need, let's help out the people who have a little bit less than they need. And um, so that gets me into the second thing that I'm thinking about, and that's that we're we're growing pretty exponentially here. And 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 Glenn and I have a lot of, you know, when we when we talk about what's going to happen, you know, two years from now and three years from now, and. And I had this idea, and we're gonna bounce it around. But I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out into the. I'm saying I'm saying this all the time. This this podcast, the universe. I'm gonna throw it out there and see what people think. Okay. But I, I love the idea of supporting projects that people want to do. Um, you know, so the idea that maybe we raise money for a specific project, almost like a Kickstarter, an sure. on education like Kickstarter, like a donors choose kind of thing. Yeah, but like sourced through us, where we say, you know, we're we're gonna get behind this 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 group for this month or this quarter. That sounds Maybe pretty cool. Maybe four four times a year, we 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 um we promote a specific we, project that someone's like, okay, I'm passionate needs, about this. I have a vision. Yeah. And I just need this in order to get and it. Maybe moving. they need a couple grand. I mean, maybe it's more yeah. money than you can just get from even school fundraising, especially in these. Yes. I mean, let's 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 be honest. If your school has very little, then I can guarantee you, your parents, the parents at the school, the families at the school, the school community has very little. Um, it they, they generally goes hand in hand. I don't think that's inaccurate. So, I mean, if we have teachers that really want to do some things, let's let's help them out. Let's see if we can raise some money for them and cut them a fat check for some Oculus Rifts or whatever's next and and let them do some bonkers things and then they can come back and talk to us about what they did with it that that everybody wins everybody sure. wins when we do that yeah so I love that idea mike you know let's we're, we're gonna give it a while we'll chew it around we're definitely gonna wait until the fall um but you know because the summer's shockingly the summer is going to be absolutely bonkers for us um but when we come back in the fall maybe we um Maybe we talk about how we can help um, a teacher do something awesome where they need, you know, a little bit of money. We can raise some money for someone. That would be that would be slick. I sounds would like, I would love to great. do that. So we're gonna take a break, and um, and when we come back, we're gonna get into some uh, some politics, some policy, some election coverage uh, from uh, both sides of the border. The end of the school year is finally here, and we have an awesome professional development opportunity. Badge Summit 2018 is happening at Columbia College on June 23rd in Chicago, Illinois. 
This one day event brings together some of the brightest and most inspiring digital badge thought leaders on the planet for highly interactive learning and sharing. Attendance is limited to 250 people, so get signed up. For more information, go to badgesummit.weebly.com. All right, friends, welcome back. So much going on in politics, policy, elections that uh, that we we never run out of room here. We always end up cutting things, and there's always something to talk about. But uh, yeah, the election up here is getting crazy, Glenn. Crazy. Yeah. The June seventh. June seventh. Advance polls are already open. I've already voted. If you're listening to this and you are a resident of Ontario. Go vote, please. Don't leave it till election day. Don't leave yourself sitting in a line waiting to vote, especially when there are definitely people who do not have the opportunity to go early and have to go there on the 7th, and it takes time away from their families. If you have the means to go vote, get your butt off the seat and go to an early polling station and vote. We did it well. our son was in swimming lessons. Uh, we don't need to necessarily be right there. He's in the water. So, you know, we just, it, it was in the same place. It was in the community center. So we went and voted. It was awesome. That's great. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I love advanced polls. So, yeah, people go vote. Go vote. Um, but crazy. So we're recording on Sunday, June 3rd for um, the record. And uh, the craziest thing happened yesterday. Do you want to hear what happened yesterday? Yes. What happened? Tell us. The leader of the Liberal Party of Ontario conceded the election, basically. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen... And she's the premier. Like, yeah. this is the government wow. saying we're going to lose. We're going to lose. I'm not going to be the premier. It's done. And we're the, done. And the election hasn't even happened yet. Not even I mean, happened yet. The vote, the the true. I mean, you've done early voting, basically, yeah. but not the official election. She already knows. Be, be it's all hands. No, oh, it's wow. the polls. The polls are that bad. Wow. So they're saying now that the um, the Liberal Party may only get eight seats, and there is someone. I was talking to someone this weekend at at the camp, and and he thinks they're only going to get one, and it's not going to be wins. See, she's going to be unemployed, basically. Um. So I mean, to talk about a talk about a fall. Um, they're going to go from. Well, I don't know what the the majority is, but uh, they had a majority government, yeah. and they're going to be down to to. There, there's what's called um, official party status. Um, when you're an official party, you get some money from the the government to support your work or sure. whatever. Okay. Um, subsidies and whatever. But you have to have 12, I believe it's 12 seats in the Ontario legislature to be considered an official party. And the Liberals right. are going to go from the government of Ontario to potentially not even having official party status, which wow. will be absolutely bonkers. Um, so it is down to, with all due respect to the Green Party, it is it is really down to the NDP who are leading in the polls now, leading full out. Uh, versus uh, Doug Ford and the um, the progressive, if you will, conservative party of Ontario. Yeah. So, um, crazy news. EPFO, the Ontario Teachers Union, is uh, all in on the NDP. Um, they were in Barrie. Uh, the leader of the uh, Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario was in Barrie with PECA yesterday campaigning. And uh, hit the hit the streets and knocked on some doors, which was exciting. Um, and the the high school union was interesting. Now I might be reading this incorrectly, but it seemed to me that the high school union had selectively endorsed different people. They hadn't done like a blanket. We're oh, supporting okay. the specific supporting party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the high school union said we're going to support this person here, this person here, this person here, and it was. Almost always liberals or well, it was either liberals or NDPs. I don't think they endorsed any green people. So they, um, but they pulled all of their liberal endorsements. So which is also crazy. And so now they're gonna push them to the NDP, NDP the probably. NDP, okay, yeah. I get you. So that's great movement. For Pretty the party wild that you support. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's exciting. Uh, you know. So I'll be at an election party on the. 
the seventh on the Thursday night, and we're not doing exit polls. We we don't have the resources to have people stand outside all the polling stations and find out who people voted for. But we're gonna we're gonna watch it on TV. Uh, as we said at the meeting, we had a meeting a couple days ago, and we said it's done. We're done. It's you know by the time you're when they leave, it's already done. So you know you can either find out five minutes early or you can watch it on tv and have a beer so we're gonna watch it on tv and have a beer there you go and um yeah it's gonna be interesting i uh i'm a little nervous i won't lie uh, i think a, a a pc uh government would be pretty terrible um for educators i and and i mean if we're trying to keep this in 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 our scope for lack of better words um you know, th- there's there's a reason why, and it's not it's not because the NDP are in the pockets of unions and blah 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 blah. Um, it's it's because the NDP have the best policies for education. Yes, it is really that there are people who are members of the PC party who want to abolish the the brand new sex ed curriculum that was introduced two years ago that um, talked about equality. And educated uh, children, kids on sexuality and gender and discrimination, and and there are people who want to get rid of that. They 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 think it's too much, you know. And um, we live in a society where we have parents that aren't teaching their kids these things, and we can't afford to not teach them these things. Um, and and it's it's really there's some really bad intent on that side and it would be dangerous it would be bad for education so regardless of whether your opinion on fo or not uh and on unions and teachers unions and remember i'm not a unionized teacher so i mean i can speak about this pretty you know uh from from both sides um i i think that um the the reality is the ndp have the best policies for education uh, they want to get rid of EQAO and um, abolish it because it's not the best way to assess. A, a giant test is not the way to assess kids. And teaching to a test is not the best way to teach kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've talked about that before when we're talking about standardized testing in general. Right. This isn't complicated stuff. So, And as a teacher, we're the ones who know about this. We're the ones who know that teaching to a test is not the way you teach kids and writing a giant test where your kid is so nervous they're throwing up before it is not the way to assess what they've learned um and so you know it's time for those things to go and um and so we'll see what happens Uh, next next week's podcast will be i'll be really happy or i'll be really upset we'll be announcing (laughs) it yes that'll be a cliffhanger exactly so yeah we need to talk about well, we're going to, again, in the name of keeping it in, in the scope of our, of our mandate, for lack of better words, uh, let's talk about Roseanne Barr uh, and what happened this week Sure, uh, well, with, with her tweet. Well, I mean, everybody, uh, <laughs> if you were alive in the universe, um, you saw or heard that Roseanne Barr had a racist tweet, which then ended up canceling, uh, ABC ended up canceling the show uh, for next season. And what I was thinking about is not even uh, regarding that tweet, but then that made me kind of think about uh, what can we learn, you know, as educators uh, about our own social media use uh, and, and what should we actually be sharing, you know, as far as out there on social media. So one of the articles that I, I found that we're going to go ahead and link to our show notes is basically an article by the NEA, uh, the National Education Association. And there's a section, actually, I think it was written, uh, it is written by Gwyneth Jones. Uh, it's, uh, she's at Gwyneth Jones on Twitter. And she has this great um, thumbnail that basically it says, uh, it's good to overshare, but about things that are about your profession and undershare your personal stuff and never share anything that's private. And really, that's what we should all be doing, using the platforms of social media, whether that be Twitter or Facebook or, um, uh, you know, Instagram or whatever it might be, 
to basically overshare those awesome things that are happening in your classroom, share those things, inspire others, connect with other people, uh, collaborate, and then be able to go ahead and continue to do awesome stuff. And really, I think it's about inspiration. When I go onto Twitter and I'm on Twitter chats or I'm just looking at specific hashtags, I'm looking for things that are inspirational or to connect with people who, who have done amazing things so that if I yeah. find someone else that has a question about whatever the topic may be, I can go, hey, I, I think I know who you should talk to. It's this person. They've actually done it with success. And at least you can have a conversation started there. So again, good to overshare the, prof- uh, the professional. And then, of course, never share anything that's, you know, something that's private. Uh, mm-hmm. And especially, I mean, of course, in this case, don't, <laughs> don't put anything that's, you know, racist or whatever might be just ridiculous yeah i mean we should be encouraging teachers to share the awesome things they're doing in their classroom when they do that other teachers can learn from that and grow and and you know the the rising tide raises all boats so to speak um and i even don't think and even though i actually don't do this very often on my professional twitter account i don't mind the teachers who get political a little bit there's important conversation. Listen, we we use the tagline "teachers." We need to talk for a reason, and it's not just about talking about 3D printing pens and um, you know the NHL jumping the shark. It's it's about you know these important serious conversations that intersect with education, and yeah, they're political, and yeah, that's fine. I think you. If you care about something enough and you think it's important to your job and your career as an educator, then you have all the right in the world to be passionate about it and talk about it on social. I mean, be be professional. Be the professional that you are. You know, avoid unnecessary words and phrasing. Um, But man, if if you believe in something, then uh, by all means... Uh, social media is the way to use your platform to uh, to share your thoughts on on everything that's going on. Totally agree, and I, I mean I know that a lot of us also, as people that use Twitter, we put as part of our profile that our tweets are our own tweets, so that we're not associated with you know our school districts or anybody else that we're employed with. Um, or the on education podcast or whatever it might be just in case so that basically everything comes down to what I you know what uh, how I felt about it then I always try to be again uh, professional I do uh, sometimes delve into the political world but again I I make sure that I'm not uh, I'm picking and choosing those topics. I'll just put mm-hmm. it that way because there is a lot of things obviously that mean you have conversations about that are like what I consider to be the dinner conversations, Mike, uh, or our phone conversations. And those, th- th- I don't need to put that stuff out there. You know, we, we right. don't need to put those things out there. And whether or not it be about politics or a specific topic, whatever it might be, um, I, I think that the platform itself is amazing uh, and a great way of being able to make those connections, especially for those teachers that live in rural environments um, and and you don't have an opportunity to be able to have a widespread uh, audience, you know, or or connecting uh, to be a bunch of different educators. uh, This is a way to be able to do that and then really change your profession for the better. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, be smart out there uh and uh go read that article we're gonna put in the show notes it's it's pretty interesting it's it's really good like um you know social media 101 for teachers if your district doesn't have a policy or or general professional advice uh if you're in uh ontario and listening to this and you haven't you should definitely read the oct the ontario college of teachers uh social media guidelines they're pretty pretty good too they might be a little bit dated um, because they were written, you know, five or six years ago or four or five years ago, I suppose. Um, and I'm not sure how often they're getting updated, but they're definitely worth a read as well. And a lot of schools follow those guidelines. So they're worth, worth taking a look at. Maybe we'll put them in the show notes as well. So if you do not have resources from somewhere else, you can look at mine. That's cool. When we come back, we are going to do our first product review. That's exciting. 
On Education is brought to you by Audible. Mike, what have you been reading lately? And I suppose you're you're kind of like me, where you have quite a few books that you have on your list. I have too many books on my list. I have <laughs> probably about 40 audiobooks on my queue. And um, between listening to podcasts and audiobooks, uh, I am well stocked. Um, lots of cool books are on Audible, hundreds and thousands of titles. And you can get your own audiobook download for free uh, if you go to audibletrial.com slash oneducation. That's audibletrial.com slash oneducation. And you can get a free audiobook download. You should go do that, like, right now. Welcome back, everyone. So we're always excited to try out and demo EdTech products and give our audience our personal reviews. So Mike, you are at your school, the head of computer studies, and you received a 3D printing pen. Actually, I think a whole set of them, but you'll talk about that in just a bit, from a company called 3Doodler. And so tell us about what you found out as you demoed the product, Mike. So this was really cool. They, they sent us an email um, and said, you want to want to give this a try and I was like yeah of course of course I want to give this a try um, so they sent us a uh, an edu kit that they're that they they just released um, and I'll tell you it's it's pretty awesome um, it came in four boxes okay. so there's four kind of two inch um, thick uh, deep boxes with um, a bunch of different materials and there was um, a teacher's kit that had a whole bunch of uh, material in it, lesson plans and stuff like that. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and there was a, a box that had just the the plastic um, for the, the the printing pen, and then there were two student boxes. And each box had um, three printing pens in them, the basic printing pen that they make. Yeah. Uh, as well as three charging cables, um, and then um, some some um, templates. For, for designs that, that we'll get into in a minute. So the packaging is great. It's um, it's all put together super nice. The, the boxes have uh, um, a magnetic kind of latch on them so that they close tight, um, which can be a problem when you have kids in, in your classroom. Everything is kind of fastened down with these cool uh, elastic bands. Nice. Um, so that nothing kind of spills out of the boxes. Um, I think that whoever designed the packaging obviously, you know, thought about what it would be like to have these in a classroom um, where kids will be, you know, they won't be nice and neat inside, you know, a container or whatever, you know, they'll be, they'll be out and used and, and you want them kind of to be held, everything to be held in a little bit nicer so it doesn't, stuff doesn't fly out and, and yeah. get around and, and it, everything is held down really well. Um, the only the only drawback on the stuff in the packaging was that the USB cords are, are a little bit short, um, but you know because I, I guess I don't know where outlets are you know outlets are in just normal outlet places but they're not usually like right against the the a desk or table like they're not down that far where the the outlet ends and the desk begins because this cord is literally when I say they're short. They're maybe three inches long at the most. Oh, strange. So, so I when we were when we plugged them in at, at our house here, um, we we they were literally just hanging down from the outlet. So we we used um we used one of our iPad bricks. So they're a USB charger, a USB um, to a micro USB charger. Sure. Um, so we used our iPad brick to charge it because they don't come with bricks either, oh. which is interesting. Yeah, that's interesting too. Yes. So then we used our we we used our iPad bricks and and they were they just kind of hung down from them in midair kind of thing. Yeah, that seems a little short, but you can always I mean if it's just a USB to like the micro uh, kind of connection, I have that for you know I use that for all kinds of different things. So if you have your own, you could just. Use I think it, the right? intent is probably to charge them by plugging them into like a laptop or a computer. Okay. Where the computer, the laptop is on the desk, and this yeah. can just plug into it. Beside that's that's where you would plug this in. I didn't do it that way because we were in my kitchen basically doing this. Sure. Um, but but that's I, I guess that's where you would you would you, I mean frankly with the cord being that small that's probably your only 
good choice. In a classroom, I don't think having these things hanging down off of a brick, off of a, off of a, an electrical receptacle is probably a, a smart choice. Yeah, so, I mean, I know that the first question that people are going to ask us is, how much do they cost? That's the, always the biggest inhibitor. We're talking about I, this. I saw the final product of this. It reminds me of something you would be able to use, for example, in a maker space or in, in like a classroom like yours where you're doing some very cool, innovative things. So wh what's the cost, Mike? So the EDU kit that they sent me, I think it starts at $350. Um, and then it can it can be I think ramped up quite a bit um, depending on the actual pen that you choose. Three Doodler makes um, multiple pens yeah. uh, of varying quality. Now the pens that are in the one that they sent me are the the entry level ones. Okay. And and those pens alone are are fifty bucks. So so they sent me uh, each kit had six six pens. So you got six in pens. It. Okay. Yeah, yeah, which is great. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a lot. That's awesome. That's a whole um, station, and and it had a quite a bit of plastic in it. So the only there there are a couple uh, interesting things about the devices itself. I, I guess the first thing I noticed um, was that if you when you feed one of the 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 plastic um, strips into the the plastic um, round tubes into the into the back of the the pen. Um, you have to use that whole thing un until you can get to a new color. Oh, so, interesting! Right, because you can't you can't take it out once it's in the pen. Oh, like almost yeah, like yeah. a glue gun. You know how a to glue gun totally you feed the glue saying. into the back, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Well, and then once it's like in there deep, you you can't like extract that. And this is this is even worse. It's really like in there. Uh, once it's like buried in the in the actual enclosure of the the pen itself. You can't extract it. So what I found is, you know, so I made this little on education text um, and, and I wanted to do it in two different colors, similar to our actual logo. So I did the on in, in gray and then I wanted to switch to blue and I realized, oh man, I can't, I can't just like switch. I get you. I have to, I have to use all of the plastic, the gray piece of plastic. Now they're not huge. The, they're, they're maybe about eight inches long. Okay. So so and they're thin. They're they're one or two. Oh, I was about to say they're one or two millimeters in diameter. Do you know what one or two millimeters are? I do, Glenn. I do, Glenn. Do you know what one or two millimeters are? Yes, I just don't know kilometers. <laughs> the millimeters are fine. <laughs> you, you, you do, eh? Okay, so it's like it'd be what? It'd be like about a, an eighth of an inch, an maybe an inch. just a or less. maybe just a little bit. <laughs> more than an eighth okay. of an inch <laughs> got you there that was a good one yes definitely so hey mike i was thinking about this too so when you get yeah. these kind of kits you talked about there's like a teacher part of it too so are there lessons yeah. that come with it what describe those things that came along with it so there is there's a decent amount of material in this there are two lesson plans um and and you know my wife and i were looking at them my wife's a, a kindergarten teacher um and, and and she said, you know, these would be these are going to be perfect for for kindergarten. So so she's actually taking it to school tomorrow. That's awesome. <laughs> to, to use, there's um, it's a balloon blowing. Like you know how you get the little dipstick thing that you you dip into the into the balloon mixture and you 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 blow through the 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 hole and it blows bubbles, right? Yeah. So but you can make one with this. So she's gonna and you can make like different designs. Um, of of balloon uh, of bubble sorry of bubble um, of bubbles different designs of bubbles I don't know what I'm trying to say but a bubble maker it's not my wheelhouse I'm not a kindergarten teacher <laughs> give me a break <laughs> there's um, there is some really cool booklets in this though that really got me going so um, there is uh, what they call the doodle block guide. So inside the box were these silicone templates that you could like um, pour the plastic into that then created different things like grooved lines or swervy lines, but they were templated for you. So you didn't, nice. you know, so they were nice and even and balanced, right? Yeah. And there was about five or six of these different templates that had like different designs on them. And um, I was like, okay, these are neat when I saw them 
But then you open up this book and you, you see what they're doing with these templates to build like much more complex structures. Okay. And you're like, oh man, it just, it blew my mind. Yeah, no, I, I really like that, the idea of being able to then, you know, you build this and then you'd be able to put this next level onto it and then whatever it might be. And then your final product is a combination of a bunch of different things that you were able to do. That's, that's super cool. Yeah, there was like, they were building houses with the templates, like with the different templates, flowers with multiple patterns, like using multiple patterns and putting them all together. Really, really cool stuff. And, I, and I'm like, you could, you could definitely take those doodle block silicone templates and use them in maybe a more junior or primary level, like a grade one, two, three level yeah. to do some really neat artwork. Um, for sure, for sure. Um, and then there is what they call the activity guide, and it, it, and it even ramped it up even more. On the on the cover of the activity guide is is the Eiffel Tower. Oh my goodness! Drawn with the the 3D printer, w with the with the pen, yeah. um, and it's it's absolutely amazing. And I was like, can you really do this stuff with this? I mean, I, I would have to say that the person who's doing this. Um, these these templates has probably got some pretty serious chops. Sure. Because uh, I certainly don't have the same skill. But on the cover, there's a Big Ben as well, the the clock tower sure. you know, in London, uh, and uh, butterflies and and glasses and uh, dinosaurs like like where like you can do the bone structure of the dinosaur. Jeez, that's and awesome. And what's really cool about this activity guide is that they show you a picture of it but then they also have like the um a template so what you do is they it came with um plastic like a like a mat okay a, a clear plastic mat that you could set on top of the book or you could photocopy the book um with the template uh but you then would set this plastic on top of it and then you could just go over top of the lines in the book that's so smart that's awesome. To make whatever you wanted to make from this book. And like I said, there's there's an Eiffel Tower example in here. So there's literally the the example of building the Eiffel Tower in different pieces and structures, uh, components of it is all in here. You can you can do this. And that's pretty awesome to me. I was I was thinking about this for like even more intermediate kids to have to like get them to replicate certain structures or buildings for sure uh, in in miniature you could you could totally do that with this and 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 it's still it's still um something that you could use to do my dream kind of work on this which is to build game pieces for making board games um custom board games oh, made yeah. by the kids and stuff That's like that perfect so for that yes yeah totally um so so this is a, a really really neat um, really neat kit, and and I can I can see the potential uh, for this quite easily. It's really exciting. Cool. Are we gonna go ahead and link their site then? Yeah, so yeah. We'll so that, right? so I might even I might even write something up uh, a little bit later. Um, yeah. I'm gonna I'm, maybe I'll even try to do it this week. Okay. But um, and take some pictures uh, of some of the things we're gonna make some more things here this week. Uh, I've only really made the 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 little uneducation text thing that I. That I that I I showed you in a uh, text message, yeah. but I, I'd like to make uh, a couple more things maybe, and um, and then write up a, a bit of a review ourselves. So two reviews on the blog. Ooh. Two. We're doing awesome. <laughs> so I would I would definitely suggest that people look into this if they have just a little bit of money but want to take like a pretty barrier to entry free way into 3d printing without having to go buy like a $1,300, you know, uh, 3d printer, a maker bot. You sure. don't have to jump into maker bot right away. You can, you can get this thing from three doodler and, uh, and really test the waters, get your comfort level up before you, you dive into some other things. Uh, and I, I, it goes without saying that you can do some pretty advanced stuff with this. So this is, if you have a maker space now, yeah, this is this is a really solid addition to that. It seems like it. Like it doesn't seem like it's just limited to you know like your wife's teaching kindergarten kids. That's fantastic yeah. that you can even use it at that that young of a level, and then 
you I mean I'm thinking even my 10 or 11 year old son and the things that they can create you know with the things that come to their minds you know and those types of things uh, like you just said for your game design studio man talk about being able to go ahead and create custom uh, pieces for your games man that's oh, awesome that's awesome you just gave me a wild idea love it you could you could totally like do stop motion um oh, build like yeah. characters build characters with the 3d printer turn them into stop motion characters and then and then uh oh i have an idea awesome love um, it man I, you 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 um you wrote a note here while we were talking about about yeah. safety and I wanted to talk about it because it is interesting that one of the things I noticed is that the the plastic is not particularly hot when, once it comes out. That's weird. That's what I was wondering. You know, like a hot glue gun. Uh, you don't want a kindergartner or my six year old. I don't want them anywhere near a hot glue gun, obviously, because yeah. it's dangerous. But in this case, you have this this thing and it's creating. Uh, I mean, it just in my mind it it makes me think of hot glue, but when it spits it out, it's not hot. It is hot, but it cools like almost instantly. And okay. the tip, the tip isn't hot. Like it's not a metal tip. It's got a plastic enclosure around around the the heating element is further inside. I think of, okay. of the device, and then it's fed out um, in a nice little, almost exactly the same diameter of tube. Um, type dimension that it is when it's coming in the uh, coming in from the back so um okay. but i i think these are totally safe for for even young kids for sure so yeah uh 3d three doodler 3d pens teacher edu kits 349 uh check them out on their website we'll put some information in the show notes and be on the lookout for a review in the next little while. Yeah, pretty cool stuff. Awesome. Yeah. So when we come back, we'll be talking to the tech rabbi, Rabbi Michael Cohen. Friends, On Podcast Media is getting set to launch not one but two new podcasts this summer, and we're excited to tell you about the first one, On Politics. On Politics is hosted by politician, professor, and human rights lawyer Craig Scott. On Politics will take deep dives into policy and politics. You definitely come away learning something every week. To stay up to date with On Politics, follow the show's Twitter account at On Politics Pod. All right, welcome back. On the podcast today, we're thrilled to chat with Michael Cohen. Uh, Michael, the tech rabbi, is the director of innovation at Eula Boys School in LA, and he will be uh, the keynote speaker, one of the keynote speakers at ISTE on uh, Tuesday, on Tuesday, June. 26. Welcome uh, to the show, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no problem. Um, I like to start by talking about your path to today. Uh, a lot of our listeners are new educators and aspiring ed tech, you know, mentors and speakers. Some people are just getting started. I, I can even remember some of the people that have helped me uh, along my path to to talk talking in front of kids is way different than talking in front of your peers and adults and so you're about to keynote arguably uh the world's largest uh conference for education in the whole world uh and that's amazing can you give us a brief timeline you know what got you here uh, well, no pressure no pressure sometimes i forget i'm keynoting this uh this conference <laughs> um but it, it's it's an interesting journey. I'm not going to go all the way back to the beginning um, of my professional career, you know, right out of university. But I, I did just start in the world of design and marketing communication. I think that's some just important context for your listeners and really anyone who engages with me is that I never imagined that I would become a professional educator. Uh, I always loved teaching and helping people learn new things, but as as a profession, there's just no way. 10 years ago, you would have told me uh, that that would be the year I would enter into uh, the professional education space. So I just finished my ninth year this year um, as, a, as a professional educator, as a director and administrator. And in 2014, I had already been on Twitter for a couple of years, engaging with a really powerful and inspiring group of educators all over the world. And I decided that it would be interesting to try to present at a conference and showcase some of the work that I had been doing with teachers, with students, and, and why not? 
So I submitted to one of EdTech Teacher's uh, innovation summits. It was mm-hmm. actually a, a one-off, uh, the one in Chicago in 2014, which is uh, very apropos that I'll be in 2018 keynoting uh, the ST conference in Chicago. So full circle there. And people received my talk well, and I realized, oh, I also am a pretty decent speaker, I guess, a decent storyteller. But that goes back to the work I was doing in the design space where I was helping nonprofits really craft their message. How do you communicate and resonate with your audience? And I just kept putting out work and really publishing work and just because I felt that I wanted to provide value for people. And I think that really is the root cause of what success I've had up until now. Uh, It's very little to do with me. I think anyone can do it. It's your desire to want to provide value for others. I think as educators, that's intrinsic in who we are because we're in a space for so many hours a day trying to give over to someone, uh, aka the students, that sometimes don't even appreciate what we're trying to do for them. (laughs) And that really has been just the driver of all of my work and presenting at different conferences, South by Southwest, um, Apple education events. I'm an Apple distinguished educator. And I think that also played into it. But once again, all of these, you know, recognitions and conferences that I've spoken at, it's really just, I want to help people and I want to put my stuff out there. So I spend, um, a, a huge amount of time putting together content, whether it's audio, video, face-to-face, online social, uh, in written form, just trying to help educators uh, develop creative confidence and come up with new ideas themselves or take the ideas that I have come up with and utilize them in their classrooms. But I think that's really sort of the journey is just I want to help and the opportunities come and I, I can't take too much credit uh, for it because I really believe that when you are trying to do good for people, then good things happen to you. That's awesome. It's funny, actually, you mentioned the EdTech teacher conferences. That's actually where I, my first education conference was EdTech teacher in Boston, actually, I think that exact same year, uh, November, that would have been November 2014, I think. And um, that's when I realized, you know, I think I could do this. Um, I didn't speak at that conference, um, but uh, I definitely walked around there with a different sense of things um, that that I could I could I could do that. I could I I have things worth sharing is is, is I guess what I was thinking too. Um, so it's funny we we connect on on that level as well. Um, I I try to do as much research and and I, I'm excited about this question. I, I try to do as much research and digging as I can. Uh, about guests. And uh, I'm really interested in how your faith intersects with your work. Um, Because you became a rabbi in 2014, from as far as I can tell, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And and you and you go by the name, the tech rabbi, and and that can't just be a marketing thing. I mean, it, it can be, but I'm not sure that it actually is. And Maybe um, if you could talk about your experience becoming a rabbi, but also how you connect it to your job and your career. Yeah. So 2012, I started a rabbinic program, and I have always loved learning and just maybe the things that I love to learn about maybe didn't work out or, or intersect so well with my uh, traditional uh, education path. But I definitely feel this this lifelong learning thing is, is such a real thing. And it's something that we, we just have to continue because it still hasn't permeated the culture of, of education at large. But even in the work that I do in the business space and various industries, they all are valuing now this idea of lifelong learner. And it's not just enough to get a prestigious degree from a top university and then get this job and then, and then you know, work till retirement. Be constantly developing yourself and enhancing the skills and the, the knowledge that you have is, is something that is, is well respected. So I didn't become a rabbi because I wanted the title. I became a rabbi because I was interested in a program that would really challenge me to learn 
a significant amount of content, a lot of material, and very complex discussions. And I just felt I was up for the challenge. So I spent uh, with uh, I had a a um, the, the Hebrew word is chavrusa. Uh, uh, it's like a learning partner, and we spent um, a good three four days a week for a numbers a number of hours, just you know going through this this vast. Um, database, if you will, of, of Torah knowledge. Hmm. And as I started to kind of look at, you know, who am I? Um, I didn't realize at the time that there would be another Michael Cohen that would become very famous. So I'm glad that I, I have a differentiator. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is so good. So, <laughs> so I, I came up with this idea of, okay, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rabbi and there's, you know, tech is a big part of the work I do. So I should try to come up with something memorable. So there is a little bit of a marketing ploy. I won't deny it. And, and just being memorable. And n- no one is going to ever forget the tech rabbi. Um, right. In this case, um, you know, they, they might not ever forget Michael Cohen, but that, that might not be for good reason. So as far as the intersect, you know, I... I'm in the world at large, and it's not that I do a lot of, of, of work exclusively in the Jewish community. So I, I have to be sensitive to the needs and, 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 the, and the desires of my audience. So for me, I feel that the things that, that shine in, in my work as you know, being a rabbi is really developing people's sense of kindness and sense of, of moral character. And so I might not be uh, necessarily giving, you know, a Bible class during one of my sessions. I do share different insights and different powerful either verses from the Bible that I feel represent something that is empowering for my audience. Yes, And I think it's important that people stop d- disconnecting things that they do in their lives is this is the this is the spiritual Michael Cohen this is the personal Michael Cohen this is the professional we obviously have to have boundaries but I think that there's something beautiful about trying to intersect all that we do and I think that my you know my work as an artist uh, first as a you know professional but then more now as just a hobby you know I I bring that into the work that I do and so I, it's it's important, I think, for me to ensure that I, you know, that I'm true to myself and I keep to, you know, what what my, you know, what my culture, what my religion um, represents for me. But at the same time, I feel like there's there's powerful things that that we can learn that that I learn from other cultures, from other you know areas of the country, even of just what people what people do, what they what the, what they experience, and I think that. Some of the, the I think success of of what um, what I'm doing is also because I, I think I'm just kind of interesting and 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 I don't want to use the word like exotic, but I you know I'm I'm not you know very very few people um, have met Orthodox rabbis. Mm -hmm. Um, in, let's say, the middle of the country. So when I go to Indiana or Texas or Oklahoma, sometimes this is the first, you know, Orthodox Jew that they're ever meeting. And so I feel like I'm also sort of like a a representative (laughs) sometimes of the entire Jewish people as I'm trying to obviously show a level of professionalism and and a level of just kindness and goodness as I'm trying to to give um, to others. Definitely pushing people outside of the box that that uh, the perception of you know with the ed tech person or the technology associated person and you know that's that's pretty rad. That's that's great. Um, you're speaking on Tuesday. We're really excited about it. We're going to be there right at the front. Big smiles, and uh, we'll we'll try not to make you laugh or anything like that. We, Glenn Glenn does that sort of stuff. I won't do that. I'm not that sort of guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, can you give us a, a little sense of, of what you're going to be talking about uh, on your in your presentation? So the, the core of my you don't talk, have to, you don't have to spoil the whole thing. Yeah, that's fine. No, <laughs> you know, it's I'm gonna I'm gonna have surprises in it, but I, I think you know there's there's nothing that you know you you won't miss out. Hopefully, if you hear what what's going on on this podcast, but I think. The core mission right now of the work that I'm doing, uh, it's in the the work I'm doing as a director of innovation, the work that I, I put into my book that 
I hope is coming out before the end of 2018, um, but I'm, I'm still a little unsure about that. Um, and this keynote is helping people develop uh, their creative confidence and, their, and a creative mindset and how we all have that. And we just need to understand how to develop it. You know, sort of like if you wanted to go to the gym to start working out and have a fitness plan, you know, you would you would probably not just go there and start, you know, on the treadmill. You might look on YouTube, you might read some articles, you might download a cool app, or maybe you hire a per, you know a personal trainer. And I think that the our, our the way that we think is the same way. So it, the the talk is going to have this creative confidence builder kind of you know this is the strategy to develop that in ourselves as professionals in our students what types of environments and experiences are needed and then I'll I'll touch on something that I will be crafting to be K twelve but I'll be showcasing you know, I'm at a high school now high school students that are developing uh, entrepreneurial tendencies and entrepreneurial ways of thinking. And that doesn't mean that they'll start their own businesses or start their own app startup, but there's certain ways that entrepreneurs think that everyone can benefit from those skills. And so I teach those skills in my entrepreneur studio, and I'll talk a lot about that because I want to see more of these types of programs be developed. So I'm hoping that I'll have a a successful call to action where I will create a community um, at ISTE where we will together begin the fall trying to figure out what does it look like in our classrooms and our schools to create some sort of space and time to support entrepreneurial thinking because that is where creativity is going to thrive and these are the skills beyond the academic knowledge and skills that we need our students to have because this is what the world of work wants and will want in the next five years and, and almost demand in the next five years. That's amazing. That's, that's great. I, I love the idea of um, instilling in our students uh, independence. That's, a, that's definitely an entrepreneurial um, trait, uh, certainly goal setting and ambition and, and um, you know, ind- independence. These are, these are great skills. And, and I, I try to do that in my classroom a lot with some of the project-based learning stuff that I do. Tell us, um, you, you mentioned a book. So now I have to ask about a book. Uh, but I guess I, I could just ask, you know, what's the book about? But I'm also interested in, in the, the, the process of writing a book. We, we've talked to a few people who have written books already. Uh, I'm kind of sort of struggling to do my own. And uh, I, I'm interested in, in your process. What are you, what are you doing to, to write your book? Is it, is it done? Or, and, and you're just waiting for a window? Or is, it, um, is this something you're, you're working on? And frankly, is it something you're, you're struggling with in terms of, of getting it done? There's, there's a lot of interesting nuance to writing a book. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah. So a couple, couple pieces. So the first is uh, the, the book was... Um, is will be published under Dave Burgess's publishing company. So I already have a publisher. I've already submitted uh, a manuscript, and right now it's just sort of going through the process of um, of, of editing and, and yeah. you know sort of uh, either constructing or reconstructing it. I know that I still have a little bit more to write, but for me, my struggle has always been that it's hard for me to believe that the, that what I'm writing or what I'm saying um, is good. I know it sounds like really weird and it's not that I, I don't have self-esteem. It's just, I, I struggle with like, well, you know, anyone could say that, right? Anyone could come up with that. And so writing the book I feel is, is the hardest thing that I've ever done in this space because when I talk, I refine my talks, I can update them. You know, I put things out on social and like th- those are all organic, but I'm writing a book book that's going to be physically printed and it, it won't have me there to explain it. It really has to live on its own. Um, so that, that's been a, a hard process for me. Um, not, I have tens of thousands of words, so the, the words are not necessarily um, hard to come up with. It's just coming up with something that I feel is going to make a difference in the life of a, of a student or a teacher. 
So, Michael, this is Glenn. Um, you said you originally came from the design world, which I think that's awesome and super interesting because last week we had Paul Dervasi on the show and he said that he sees that the teaching profession becoming more designers of learning environments. Is this something you also believe in? And how is design connected to teaching and learning? So it's it's connected in an incredible way. Um, I believe that all teachers are designers. And I wish that there was something um, in our teacher programs that emphasized that more. Uh, we're, we're designers of space. We're designers of experiences. We're designers of, of human-centeredness. And sometimes I think that because we don't have that explicit design mentality, a lot of teachers can struggle with it. You know, they're given a curriculum, they're given a class, and they're told, you know, this class will cover this, and good luck, we'll, uh, we'll review you periodically, but we'll see you in June. And so I, I think it's really important for, for educators to get more involved and, and become more knowledgeable in the design thinking space, in um, all, all different types of design. You have classical design, you have computational design, you have design thinking. So each one of those, you know, it represents a different area. Um, but what happens is, is that I think that lack causes a certain stagnant existence in, in education. And it's, it's, it's not due to the people, it's due to the process. And by being more sensitive yes. to uh, design strategies, things like you don't need thirty or even five thousand dollars to transform your classroom into an incredible space for learning. Uh, you can do it even just with what you have or a couple trips to the ninety nine cent store. Um, but it's really something that uh, is important for educators to to begin to get educated on. And I, I say this all because I see ISTE's standards evolving. Uh, and not being so much focused on technology tools, but now uh, technology is a way to help us uh, connect and think and create. And they're 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 innovative designer uh, standard. I'm I'm presenting a, a breakout session at ISTE on this on this standard um, is important. Oh, fantastic! Because it it begins the process of educators learning about ways in which design is already part of their life as a professional educator, but that they didn't know that, that, that yes. there was a terminology for it, or they didn't know how to seek out uh, ways to develop it uh, further. Awesome. Uh, Michael Cohen will be speaking at ISTE on Tuesday, June 26th. Uh, if you're going to be there, you should definitely be uh, listening to him, and uh, it sounds like it's going to be a, a great talk, and we're looking forward to, uh, to listening to it. I really appreciate your time, Michael. Thanks for uh, joining us. Thanks so much for having me. On Education is an on-podcast media production. My name is Mike Washburn. My co-host is Glenn Irvin. You can get in touch with us or ask us questions to answer on air by visiting our website, oneducationpodcast.com. You can tweet us at oneducationpod. Glenn is at Irv Spanish on Twitter. I can be found on Twitter at Mr. Washburn. Our sound engineer is Jake Codeweiss. He's on Twitter at JK Radio. You can find us on Facebook by visiting facebook.com slash oneducationpod. If you're enjoying the show and think others would too, we would be honored if you shared it with them. Please leave us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or the Google Play Store. When you leave a rating, it gives our rankings a boost. This helps others discover the show. We want to thank our presenting sponsor, Schoology, for supporting us. Check out Schoology.com to learn how they can help you advance what's possible. Thanks as always for listening. Stay awesome. See you soon.